Welcome to this presentation on the topic of conformity. Conformity occurs because the behavior of other people sets up expectations as to what the social norms of the group are, and we feel pressure to go along with these norms. Remember that social norms are simply the rules for behavior. In this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about laboratory studies of conformity, but keep in mind that conformity pressures in the real world, uh, say at work or in the military or even in your social groups, are actually much stronger and more intense than the things we're going to describe from psychology experiments. Conformity is a very subtle form of social influence. Usually the people around us aren't explicitly asking us to do anything or giving up orders. We're just taking cues from their behavior as to how we should behave. And this is different from some other forms of social influence. Compliance, for example, is what we do when we go along with a direct request from somebody that we engage in a particular behavior or action. And obedience is an even stronger form of social influence where someone is giving us a direct order and commanding us to do something. I'm not going to talk too much about compliance in this part of the course. Uh, I will talk quite a bit about obedience in another PowerPoint show. There are several very entertaining conformity uh, video clips that I would like you to watch. You will enjoy them, I promise. Uh, you can see them by clicking on the links on this slide or you can go to the web page for the course and there are also links to those videos there as well. The very st first laboratory studies on conformity were done in the 1930s by a social psychologist named Musafer Sharif. Sharif used something called the autokinetic effect to study conformity in his laboratory. Let me first explain to you what the autokinetic effect is. If you're in a completely darkened room and a small pinpoint of light is shining somewhere off in the distance. The light appears to move. Now the light actually isn't moving, but uh, in this totally dark environment with no other cues, the light appears to drift around. Now some people will see it move quite a bit, others will see it move only a small distance, but everybody perceives some motion in this light. That's what the autokinetic effect is, and this is the tool that Sharif would use to study conformity. One of the reasons that Sharif selected the autokinetic effect was because psychologists at that time believed that people conform primarily in situations where it's not clear what's going on. They don't feel like they have enough information to know exactly what they should or should not be doing, and therefore they look to other people for guidance. We kind of tag along on the behavior of others because we think maybe they know something that we don't. And sure enough, in Sharif's experiments, he discovered that people's judgments about how much the light was moving could be very easily swayed and influenced by the judgments being made by other subjects in the experimenter. And sometimes Sharif would plan a confederate of his, one of his assistants, uh, in the experiment posing as a regular subject, and have that person uh, move the other individual's judgments in one direction or another by making suggestions about how much the light moved. So Sharif's experiments confirmed that in fact we do conform when we're unsure of what's going on around us. However, a series of fascinating experiments by a social psychologist named Solomon Ash clearly demonstrated that people will also conform in situations where it's very clear that the group is wrong, but most of the time we go along anyway. Uh, there's an entertaining dramatization of Ash's studies that you can look at uh, by clicking on the link that you'll find on the web page for this chapter in the course. Anyway, in Ash's experiments, people were in what they thought was a perception experiment. They were making judgments about the lengths of lines. And so, for example, on this slide, you would look at the uh, line on the far left side and pick out which line of the three matched it most closely in length. The tasks were pretty easy. It's pretty easy to look at this and see that line A is a good match for the um, stimulus line. 
And most of the time, if people were just making these judgments on their own, they got it 100% correct. However, in Ash's experiments, uh, he would have the subjects one at a time say which line they thought matched, and there was only one real subject in the experiment, and that person was always the last one to answer. And what Ash discovered was that in this situation, about 75% of the people went along with the bad judgment of the group, even though they probably knew that the group was wrong. This was kind of groundbreaking because up until this time, um, most people would have thought, well, no, people won't conform in a situation like that. But clearly they did. So Ash was the first to identify two different types of conformity. According to Ash, conformity can be informational or normative in nature. Informational conformity is what occurs when we go along with the judgment of a group because we think the group knows something that we don't. We think that there's some trick or we're just not seeing things correctly, and so we go along with the judgment of the group because we trust them. In normative conformity, on the other hand, we know that the group is wrong. We know that the things that they're saying uh, are just not correct, but we go along anyway, maybe because we want to be accepted by the group, or maybe we simply want to avoid the hassles uh, that might come from arguing with people, or just the, the discomfort we experience by being different. Ash and other researchers uh, used this procedure over and over again and manipulated all kinds of variables to help us figure out how conformity works, and I'll get to some of those things in a moment. But there were many other ways of studying conformity uh, during this period of time. There was something called the Crutchfield apparatus, for example, where subjects were divided by partitions from other people, and they were typing on uh, like a computer terminal and answering questions, and they were seeing the answers that other subjects were giving to these, experiment, uh, these questions, and they found that they could get people to conform uh, to the judgments of other people in crazy kinds of ways. For example, uh, in a study of 50 military officers, they found that they could get more than a third of them to agree with the statement, I doubt that I would make a very good leader, just because they thought other people were giving that answer. In private, none of them agreed with the statement. They also got people to uh, agree with statements like 70% of the population is over the age of 65, or the average American eats six meals per day. So regardless of what technique is used, we find that conformity is actually a pretty robust phenomenon. Based on all of these different techniques, we've learned a lot of things about the factors that affect conformity. First of all, if you have just one ally, one other person that's willing to stand up to the group, that person uh, gives you the guts to sort of be a nonconformist. If you're the only one out there uh, who's disagreeing with the group, it's much harder to not conform. People are also more likely to conform if they have recently deviated from the group in some important way or have been embarrassed in front of the group. It seems like they're much more willing to now conform to do anything to get back into the group's good graces. The relative status of the group members matters. Uh, high status group members conform less than lower status group members. When I was a student back in the 1970s, we learned that women conformed more than men. Uh, we now know that's not the case. The problem in the early studies was that a lot of the tasks were things that men were more stereotypically good at and confident about. And of course, women conformed more on those kinds of tasks. If you switch the task around so that it was something that females tended to be better at, you now found that men conformed more. So there doesn't seem to be any consistent sex difference in the rate of conformity. As group size increases, conformity pressure increases, but once you get up to around four or five individuals in a group, making the group larger than that really doesn't have much more of a noticeable effect. So conformity pressures peak at around four or five people. The more cohesive a group is, the stronger the conformity pressures are. Uh, 
when you're in a group where everybody likes each other and everybody gets along and there's this feeling of camaraderie, there's a lot of pressure to maintain that harmony and not mess it up. And you also want the group to prevent to present, excuse me, a united front. And so there are pressures to go along with the group that are stronger than you would find in a group that was less cohesive. When the behavior that you're engaging in is public, meaning other people are going to be able to know uh, what you are doing, you're much more likely to conform than if you were, say, writing the answers down rather than saying them out loud, and therefore people would not know whether you were conforming or not. The more ambiguous the task is, meaning the less certain it is, uh, the more likely you are to conform. So a task like the autokinetic effect that we described earlier uh, creates a lot of conformity pressure. The personality of the individual also influences how much he or she will conform. Uh, people who score high in a trait called authoritarianism tend to conform more. Authoritarian individuals are ones who respect power structures. Uh, they're very respectful of authority figures and are very uh, conforming to the behaviors and requests of um, people high in authority. On the other hand, when high authoritarian people are in a position of leadership, they demand that same sort of uh, respect from the people beneath them. People that are high in the need for social approval tend to conform more. Uh, these are people who care what other people think about them. They want other people to like them and approve of them. And this leads us to be a little more conformist. People who have an external locus of control. Uh, these are people who don't feel like they have a lot of control over what happens in their life. They see themselves as sort of a pawn at the mercy of fate or powerful other people. Uh, not surprisingly, these types of individuals are more conforming. And self-esteem is also a factor. The higher you are in self-esteem, uh, perhaps the less likely you are to conform. Cultural background makes a difference. Your textbook describes the difference between individualistic and collectivistic societies. Uh, conformity is a, a virtue, not a vice, in a collectivist society uh, where the group takes precedence over the individual. So it's not surprising that conformity uh, is more easily found in these kinds of cultures, but it's also judged to be a good thing rather than a bad thing. And finally, what a person's social role or social status is matters. And let me make a distinction between these. Your social role is the set of behaviors that you're expected to show because of your place in the group. For example, if you have a work group, there might be one person whose job it is to sort of be the, the class clown who takes stressful situations and turns them into lighthearted moments, who keeps people laughing, who tries to break up uh, the monotony of the workday. Uh, so if you're the class clown, your social role uh, leads people to expect you to engage in certain kinds of behaviors. Another person in the group might be the mother hen who looks out for the well-being of other people and who's very sensitive to uh, who's in a good mood today and who isn't and tries to do what he or she can to sort of take care of people. Uh, another individual in the group might be the go-to person during crunch time, the one that you can count on to get things done. So we all have different roles in the groups that we belong to. Now some of the social roles that we have are official. They're part of your job description. They're written into uh, what it is you're supposed to be doing, but many of them are unofficial. There are things that emerge as the group performs its duties day in and day out. So, uh, your social role can affect how conforming you are in a particular situation. The more that the behavior in question fits the expectations for your social role, the more likely you are to conform. Social roles are not the same thing as social status. These are two terms that get used together and they get mixed up. The social role, as I just said, is the set of behaviors that you are expected to perform because of your position in the group. The social status that you have is the result of how much respect or esteem people give you because of the social role you have. It's almost like they're evaluating how important your social role is. And if your social role is considered to be quite important, your social status will be higher. But social status and social role 
are not the same thing. When people don't conform to a group, uh, it can happen for a variety of different reasons. There's something known as psychological reactance. People do not like to have their sense of freedom impinged upon. You all know the feeling of having somebody so forcefully try to get you to do something that even if it's something you originally wanted to do, you find yourself not wanting to do it just because you don't like the fact that this person is pushing you around. So in some situations where psychological reactance is um, aroused, people will be less conforming because they're feeling manipulated or pushed around by the group. Also, there are some situations where people feel a strong need to assert their uniqueness. In an individualistic society like the United States, we kind of pride ourselves on being individuals and we compete with each other for attention and we want to trumpet our uniqueness to the world. And in situations where that kind of attention will be a positive rewarding thing, we may resist looking too much like other people or acting too much like other people because we want others to recognize us as individuals. There's also something called anti-conformity. An anti-conformist is an individual who takes pleasure in being a contrarian for going against the group. So the anti-conformist closely monitors what the rules of the group are. They pay attention to the norms, but they need to do that so they can behave in exactly the opposite way. So people do not always conform, but when they don't, it can be for a variety of different reasons.